Hello everyone and welcome to how authentic engagement and data insights can optimize Chinese student recruitment in North America, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Synorbis. My name is Alastair Lawrence, I'm the Special Projects Editor at CHE and I'll be chairing today's discussion. I'm joined today by a panel of experts from academia and industry who are Nicholas Chu, CEO of Synorbis, Carolyn Ford, Director of International Undergraduate Recruitment at Western University, Michael Pippinger, who is Vice President and Associate Provost for Internationalization at the University of Notre Dame, and Sherry Wilson, Senior Director of International Admission for China at the University of San Francisco. There will be an opportunity to put questions to the panel during the final ten, five or 10 minutes of the hour that we have scheduled. So please feel free to write any questions that you do have in the box in Zoom, and we'll try to answer as many as possible before the end. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that China is a critical part of North American universities international admission strategies, while posing a unique set of challenges for higher education institutions. Today we're going to exchange knowledge and best practice about engagement strategies that work and how different institutions across North America are preparing for the future. So I'd like to start us off by asking the panel what they have found to be the best ways with which to communicate with students in China using WeChat, which is the prevailing platform for reaching so many students in that country. Um, Nicholas, perhaps I could start with you, just so you can tell us a little bit about how Synorbis is working with universities to help them do this. Sure, sure. Yes, I'd be happy to answer um, how we're working with uh, universities. So, so Synorbis is, um, is um, a software as a service that allows in universities and higher education institutions from all around the world to create, measure, and optimize their digital presence in China without the need to be, uh, to be in China. And to answer your other part of the question in relation to WeChat, um, our platform allows to do almost everything uh, on WeChat. So it's probably uh, better to, to take a step back and explain a little bit you know, what you can do with WeChat, and then it will give you an idea of uh, the possibility of how you can communicate with you know, prospective students or alumni. So WeChat is uh, what we usually describe as a super app. Um, we, we sometimes compare it to Facebook. I, I usually say that it's more Facebook on steroids. Uh, it's used by you know 1.2 billion people in in china and you can do almost everything through wechat it's more an ecosystem than than a social network you can you can even file for you know di divorce now uh, uh through wechat so you can do almost everything through wechat and everyone is using this tool you know to communicate and engage uh, with the audience so how you know can you uh can you engage with prospective students well the first thing is to create what we call a wechat official account it's very similar to a Facebook page, uh, but again, on steroids. So you can do much more than a Facebook page. You can communicate, you can post some content, which would be one way how universities are engaging with the audience uh, because they can segment their base. They can you know, create different uh, categories uh, within their, their target audience and then create different types of content uh, for each audience. Um, then they can leverage what we call the KOLs, the, the key opinion leaders, those influencers uh, mainly alumni or um, or current students that can influence and uh, provide tips or indications on how how to uh, how to do things. Uh, you can also use um, what we call the mini programs. Those are mini apps. Those are apps similar to mobile apps, but that works within the WeChat environment, and it's extremely popular in China. Everyone is using mini apps, uh, and and you can use those mini programs to. Uh, offer certain features that you won't be able to do through a regular WeChat account, such as organizing 3D tours of, you know, your, your, your campus, um, organizing, you know, uh, the list of resources that you can find in, the, in a very interactive way. So, so there are a lot of different ways uh, how you can, you can engage with your audience through WeChat. It will take probably the whole, the whole uh, session to, to go through all of them. So, but these, these will be the main ones. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Um, sure. Shari, can I bring you in just to tell us a little bit about your work at the University of San Francisco and, and how you use these platforms and what engagement strategies you have found to be most effective with Chinese students? Yes, absolutely. So with regards to WeChat, we've been using it in a, what I'm going to call an informal way until we recently parted with Sonorbis. And so we were had our, our, our USF account, which was not an official account or verified. So we weren't really optimizing the potential and full usage of WeChat. We were doing chat groups 
um, to communicate with counselors and posting content um, and personal messages with students. It was just really ineffective in how we were doing it. And we knew that we wanted to be more strategic, more intentional, and really uh, reach a, a, a wider audience within China. And so we knew that WeChat obviously was the way to go. Um, and, and we were very thankful and appreciative that we have partnered with Sonorbis. And so we are approaching those steps to becoming, uh, to addressing our critical needs with when it comes to WeChat communication with students. So we that is a process that is ongoing with us, but we are looking forward to seeing change in that area of communication. Thank you, Sherry. Um, Carolyn, perhaps I can ask you, you have many years experience of undergraduate recruitment. How, how has your role changed in regard to China, particularly over sort of the past couple of years with, with so many extra limitations being put in place? Um, well, I, I think to start, we add a little bit of context that it, it really has been over 10 years now that we have been present in the market in China in, in a very sort of determined and, and persistent way. Um, as we started to expand international student recruitment, we were very fortunate that we were able to sort of do a survey of the landscape, what skills, what people do we have in-house in with China's specific uh, cultural and linguistic skills. And so that was really the point of departure for us. Uh, in terms of recruitment, we, we have a variety of goals we're trying to pursue. So certainly as we, as we rolled out social media and as we started to use tools such as Baidu, Sino Weibo, and of course WeChat, um, we, we had to always be thinking about which audience we were, we were accessing because uh, I work primarily uh, working to where, where are those students that are academically ready, their English skills are high, they're ready to start at, as freshmen in a university program, but then also working alongside my colleagues in the Western English Language Center, once again, also making use of these same sorts of tools to make sure that the messaging that we shared via each channel would sort of hit the right target, the right audience with the right messages in, in the right tone. And so I, I think being able to do that in an authentically Chinese way has been a key to our success in, in the rapid rise of, of the volume of Chinese students on our campus and, and persisting and succeeding through to graduation. Um, you know, sort of trying to forecast going forward, uh, I think would be a little bit more challenging because, of course, uh, new ideas, new platforms are, are coming through uh, all the time. But certainly at this stage, uh, WeChat and trying to reach those various channels through it, telling our stories as a brand at large, but also recruiting specifically to undergraduate programs, English programs and graduate programs trying to have a target and nuanced way of doing that uh, different times of the year and with WeChat as a platform. So how has that changed the, the type of interaction feedback that you're getting from a prospective and, and eventual students? Are they perhaps more demanding if you engage them in a more authentic way? Do they assume that, um, that, that there is more that they can ask you or, or perhaps um, more information that they want? I mean, how, is it deepening the relationship with them? It is certainly accelerating how quickly they're aware of changes to programs or especially status of, of things like vaccination uh, on campus and what new requirements and arrival requirements are. So it has, it has rapidly amped up the speed in terms of the information cycle as quickly as we were making changes and also communicating them in Mandarin on our end we have to be ready with answers, uh, FAQs, um, Q and A's, or, or quick coffee house like chats, like get togethers. Uh, it has amped up how quickly you need to be able to offer even interim information because people are connected and they're seeing it that much more quickly. So I think that will be an ever present challenge as we go forward and, and as new channels and, and methods of keeping in touch are created. But it's a good problem to have, yeah. I would say. Absolutely. And in terms of the um, the, the expanding nature of your work and, and your colleagues, has it been has it been 
fairly intuitive in terms of the, the team members that you've added and how you've diversified or perhaps made things more international? Or was there a process of trial and error in terms of getting the balance right for having an international team um, um, dealing with Chinese students? I would say half and half. I would say some things are intuitive, but definitely uh, this is this is trial and error. Just just as software development has all those sorts of approaches and acronyms where they call it Scrum and, and Agile and trial and error. I I think that's true as well of the type of work that we do, um, which is why it's very important to to be able to say transparently, uh, especially when things are a work in progress to say to people and to update as constantly as possible um, according to the situation or as best as we understand now, this is how we're going to proceed along these lines for this week, the next several weeks. So very adaptive and, and the lovely thing about Chinese as a language and working with Chinese students is that you can draw upon parallels that they're very familiar with. One of my favorites is that there is an actual phrase that uh, gets across the idea of trial and error and, and getting from one side of the river, bridging the gap and making your way to the other side by feeling your way. And if I remember correctly and can get the tones right, it's you're crossing the river by feeling for the stones that are close to the surface of the water. And so you know, leveraging the skills that you have in house, learning more from Chinese students as you go along um, and showing respect for um, sort of the framework and the mindset that they're coming from, implementing those that into the tools that you're using. Uh, I think you see sort of um, an organic growth uh, and an ecosystem that is adaptive and responsive to the lovely groups of people that you're working with all over the world, not just China. But China, of course, is the number one. Okay, great. Thank you, Karen. Um, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about how the, the process has taken shape at, at Notre Dame? I mean, it's, it's an institution with a very global outlook anyway, but China is different to dealing with other countries, as we've discussed. Um, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you, Alistair. And it's nice to be here um, with our colleagues. Um, we have... Uh, use the WeChat platform extensively. And I think to pick up on something that Carolyn said, it's been an iterative and organic process, how it's evolved. And, and Sherry also mentioned that in her earlier remarks. We started using WeChat as a way to communicate specifically with just prospective students, as well as our own students when they were back home in China. But as we uh, continued to use WeChat and saw its power and what the platform could do for us, it started to become um, a larger operation with, with broader implications. So we're now using WeChat on top of our team in Beijing. We have a global gateway that's located in Beijing with four team members there. But above and beyond their work in country physically in Beijing or when they travel around, when they're able to travel around, um, we're still using the WeChat platform to reach out to prospective students, to high school guidance counselors, to um, our alumni to encourage them to recruit. We're, uh, we've developed parents groups uh, in different regions throughout China, each having its own uh, platform uh, on WeChat. We've also started to use it uh, here on campus with departments uh, running information sessions for graduate student recruitment as well as undergraduate student recruitment. All of those things have allowed us to get to know the, the constituents better and also to be responsive to their needs. That's the other thing I was thinking about as I was listening to, to Carolyn and her remarks, it is about storytelling, right? At first it's storytelling about Notre Dame. We, while we do have a global presence, China is a relatively new place for us. It's not as if, um, our, it's not like our relationship in Latin America where we had students from Mexico and Cuba coming as early as the, the 1870s, right? Chinese students are relatively new in the history of our institution. Um, but it's become not just about the storytelling, but also about being responsive to their needs because we're learning what kinds of things they need answered in real time. So I would use this one example. 
as the immigration landscape in the United States kept changing in the previous political administration, WeChat became a way for us to let Chinese parents and Chinese students who were in China know what the university's response was. So it could be a news source as well as a recruitment source. And the news becomes a form of recruitment because they see our commitment to Chinese students, to Chinese students and their families, and that begets a whole new level of relationship at a deeper level, which I think is what Sherry and Carolyn and, and Nicola are all talking about. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, and Michael. On, uh, sorry, on that note, Alistair, I just wanted to, to bounce back on what Michael just uh, just said, because we we definitely saw that across you know uh, the hundreds of institutions that we're working uh, worldwide, especially when the travel bans you know, were announced in the US and here in Australia. Um, and all this happened over the weekend. And we, uh, for the anecdote, we actually you know uh, we're ready to offer to all our institutions to update their content on WeChat and to to communicate with the audience to indicate you know because just in Australia we had a hundred thousand students stuck you know in China that couldn't come back, um, and and we were positively surprised to see most of our, the institutions using our platform who actually started to build the chatbots and auto responses in order to. Uh, to answer questions uh, because you know there were a lot of panic. You know, so you can imagine students blocked in China. They didn't know if they could go go back to to, uh, to the US, and and a lot of institutions leverage WeChat to communicate in real time. So I think you know Michael's example is 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 great because WeChat is a great tool for that as well. Okay, thank you. This is great to have some more examples and just see how it works internationally. Um, Michael, to your earlier point about how the the element of trial and error that's involved, I was wondering. Have you managed to address any sort of specific cultural differences that have that you found to be quite common with Chinese students? And and is this something that has been addressed perhaps through working with ac academic staff, or if was it done mainly through administration? That's a good question. I think one of the things that we learned during the time of the pandemic was that. Um, we could use the WeChat platform and the various kinds of communication groups that um, we've been discussing to share information that we might not have shared in a media format. So for instance, um, when students were unable to travel, Chi Chinese students were unable to travel either as returning students or as newly admitted students, um, who were trying to come to the US for their first semester, um, they were looking for immediate answers about, well, what's going to happen to me and my education if I'm not able to travel, right? So the platform became a chance for us to communicate about how a US university, in our case, makes decisions and problem solves in real time. And I think that's another benefit of the technologies that we're talking about today, right? So we could say to a parents group, please don't worry, we have um, university administrators from a, and faculty members from across our colleges and schools looking at everything from remote learning to um, how you might um, be able to continue your degree at a partner university in country for a semester, right? We would not have said something or shared that kind of information technically in the past in this kind of a way. But in changing times and in unusual circumstances, the platform became a way to bring people in to understand educational decision-making and also feel connected to the community. I think that's really important. I think what we all aspire to in our using of these technologies is a sense that even if you're half a world away from us, you're getting an answer immediately, you feel you're a part of the community, your voice is heard, and your unique circumstance in China is taken care of. I don't know if others felt that way in the process or using it in that way, but that's certainly how we've we've experienced it. Okay, thank you, Michael. I, I'd like to, yeah, Carolyn and, and Sherry, I, I'd just like to ask, you know, does that resonate with the work that you've been doing um, recently? And also, is are there still challenges that persist that you are that you're aware of and having to having to deal with? Uh, Sherry, I don't know if you nodded your head or if I'm just picking yeah. on you first. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, definitely, I, I echo the sentiments that Michael shared. There were a, a number of challenges, you know, as we faced with the pandemic, but WeChat was a great way for us to stay in touch 
with families, specifically with parents and students, letting them know on the academic side, as well as on the admission side, how we were there to support them. So it really just echoed our commitment to the students during this uh, difficult phase that they were in. Um, also, one of the things that we worked really hard with with students who had the travel restrictions was quickly developing partnerships to allow them to stay connected with the university while studying in their home country at a partner institution. So those, these were new partnerships that USF was able to create to accommodate students who were committed to USF. So that was in, in turn our commitment to them. Um, and then also from the academic side, the international student support service side and admissions, we really had a good understanding of the culture, um, the concerns, and just in the country context of what was needed to be able to best support those students. So we were able to utilize the WeChat platform to communicate that and just keep messaging out there um, to address the concerns that parents and families had. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Um, Carolyn, was, there, was it a similar process at Western? A similar process at Western earlier in the year with respect to uh, fall 2021, what will its modality be? Um, updating people as to sort of the timeline to a decision, uh, when we would be able to confirm on campus hybrid, um, but also with respect to China, we, we did and do have a significant number of students unable to travel to campus for, for this fall. So having a, a dual track response, um, assisting students who needed to plan for a 100% fall online course load, even as our, our faculty partners were preparing for a full return to the classroom. And so once again, for us too, working in tandem with our international student support services, really doing that deeper level of planning and support uh, day by day, week by week. So, uh, you know, I have the last name Ford, so I get to make this joke. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, I can get you any kind of car you want as, as long as it's like, as long as it's a black Model T. Whereas now we, we are in the line of work where people's needs and requirements that we need to be able to customize. And, and if you visit the, the Ford Automotive Company website now, you can order an F-150 truck in, in one of two billion different combinations that, that similarly with respect to our support to students, uh, understanding what their needs and wants are so that we can go more granular and create a customized and unique support plan for them that um, enables them to still make good progress uh, and, 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 and graduate on time. So all of these communications tools and then also working in tandem with student services and faculties were, were critical to people feeling secure about the idea that they were going to get on a plane, they were going to bring their vaccination record, they were planning on being on campus in time, but that if they weren't, there was still a support plan in place and they could still make progress. So similar story at Western as well as, as with my colleagues at, at Notre Dame and San Francisco. Okay, great. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, overall, um, uh, um, admissions in the, the US in particular have hit a couple of headlines for dipping over the past two windows. Um, I just wanted to ask the panelists, are they expecting a, a larger number of Chinese students on campus eventually? Has there been a timetable set for that? Or is it still the case that you are doing the, the, the bulk of your communicating with Chinese students digitally? Uh, Michael or Sherry? I don't know if one of you, Michael, you, you I thought you, I thought Sherry was leaning in. That's yeah, why I was going to let her go first. It's really nice. Yeah. But uh, Michael, if you don't mind going first, I'll go to Sherry. After. Sure, I can. Um, I would say uh, we're optimistic about a return to an increase in numbers. Um, Chinese students still are the number one international population on our campus. Um, we saw that most of our Chinese students were able to return for the current semester that we're in. Um, and our projection is that it would continue to, to return to the levels that we had pre-pandemic, if not go higher. Okay, and does that introduce um, an extra set of challenges when, again, the cultural differences that we were talking about before, the, 
just what is perhaps normal for being in a, the environment that we're in now in terms of different countries' responses, you know, everything from um, uh, things like face mask usage to appropriate social distancing or how much people expect to be able to use shared space. I mean, has this, does that require an extra level of, of communication with, with international students? It, it does. I think we've, we've added in a whole layer of uh, information dissemination in our orientations that we didn't have before and in our recruiting materials, right? We have to assure students at the front end, even as we're recruiting them, whether it's on an undergraduate or graduate level, that all of the topics you just mentioned, Alistair, are things that we've thought about, accounted for, have answers um, for our students so that the ease of traveling across that river that Carolyn so eloquently um, shared um, is easy and, and as pain-free as possible in this environment that's still so fluid. Okay, thank you. And uh, Shari, is it a similar situation at USA? Yeah, I'll just go back first to the first question that you asked just in our projection and, and what we are looking to, to uh, do in terms of enrollment growth for China in the upcoming uh, terms. Um, we luckily uh, for this past fall, we, we had more of an increase than we anticipated. So that was huge for us with students coming back to campus. So that showed us that there was a need and still a strong desire to, to travel back to the United States. So we were happy to see that there were still families that had concerns with the pandemic. And um, similar to as Michael mentioned, there were communications that we had to convey in different levels of our orientation. And in fact, would do um, additional webinars just on the safety protocols on our campus that we have put in place across the campus to ensure safety and, and health wellness for our, our students, which is our, our primary uh, objective. And so as we move forward, we are, we are anticipating um, small incremental growth because we know it's not going to happen overnight. There's been in recent news, another lockdown in China. Um, so that's been concerning. So as we were just optimistic about, you know, steady growth moving forward and, and hopefully getting back on, on the ground in person and events, we do have staff in China who was just scheduled to attend an event November 7th that got pushed back because of the lockdown. So we are, what we are doing just because of the uncertainties and the many challenges that keep rising is, is creating additional partnerships and being more intentional and creative in our recruitment in ways that we could um, continue to get that commitment from students to study at USF in many different ways um, that are really creative. Okay, great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, Nicholas, I'd like to bring you in, if I can, just to ask you about the, the general trends that you're observing in China in terms of uh, patterns of behavior and whether attitudes are changing. You know, are you seeing any global patterns emerge in terms of, you know, whether the appetite for, for, for moving internationally to study in person now, or whether the, the digital element of it is, is still um, uh, maintaining as, as, the, as a popular choice for many? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very good question, and there are quite diff different different answers actually. So, so um, in terms of study online or or or, or still going to to the destination country, the, the demand is still very strong to travel uh, because you know mo a big chunk of the the the, the whole. Uh, studying overseas experience is really the, the the local experience, and 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 being able to go to the US and 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 have a sense of how things are done and 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 and, and the lifestyle there. So so online is just you know a, a part of it, and obviously I think it was a great way how you know a, a lot of them could start or continue their studies, but but the demand is still very very strong to go out to go overseas. Now in terms of patterns, we we um. We do analyze the the searches that uh, prospective students are making on Baidu or Sogo and or other search engines in China, and this gives us some some good indication of uh, of trends. And one thing that we noticed definitely is the change of destinations. So that depending on you know uh, when there was an announcement or some political tensions, obviously there were different searches. Obviously, being in Australia, I can I can share that there was a big shift of demand. Uh, from Australia to Canada, and it was really obvious. I mean, Canada has always been very, very strong 
Uh, but but you know, as you know, uh, it was always the US, the UK, and then Canada and Australia. A, a big shift from Australia to Canada, especially over the last uh, six months. Uh, mainly because you know we had our borders closed here, and obviously because of the political tensions as well. Uh, so Canada definitely a big a big change, but also within the US, depending on the safety. Uh, and, and safety has always been extremely important, you know, for Chinese students, especially for Chinese parents, especially in the U.S. Uh, you know, when when they hear about gunshots and and and, and uh, things like that, and events like that, there's a lot of uh, 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 anxiety around around this. So a lot of searches, and so safety has always been very, very important. But now with the pandemic, it's also how the institution, you know, handle. Uh, uh, what was the response and how students were, you know, uh, managed and helped during this whole period. And, and this obviously was not the case before. And uh, certain countries or certain institutions did better than others. And we can clearly see that it influenced the, uh, the uh, uh, queries on the search engines accordingly. Okay, thank you, Nico. Um, Carolyn, to that point about Canada seeing being seen as uh, it, having its popularity increase during that period, is that something that you felt at Western, or is it um, how have things changed or or not? Um, well, so I'd say for the you know these two enrollment years influenced by the pandemic, um, Western has been very very uh, fortunate that the that the enrollment numbers have been steady. Uh, certainly, we're hoping that uh, as we enter the last legs of the pandemic and as things get more to normal, we would certainly love to welcome uh, an even higher number of Chinese students, as, as well as uh, students from other countries of origin around the world. So we're certainly looking to expand our, our digital footprint and our brand presence uh, around the world because we, we would like to welcome more people on campus. And and we're very fortunate in Canada that that we're part of the, that larger Canadian dynamic of being able to say that with the postgraduate work permit program and the study permit protocols that we have, that anybody who's uh, an international student on a valid full-time study permit is and and completes the four-year degree is is earning the eligibility to work. And, and be in Canada for up to 36 months after earning that degree. And then different degree length programs have, have a different amount of time associated with them. And recent changes, so such to the effect that if you're completing a, a 12 month master's that that also comes with postgraduate work permit eligibility. I mean, we certainly see and, and we benefit from, from Canada's popularity um, in, in that regard. Um, but at the same time, we, we fully understand it is a competitive landscape. Uh, one of the things we're very aware of in Canada, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Australia, is that we do tend to have higher English language proficiency requirements coming into undergraduate programs. So we know that we are um, competing against that. And then similarly, with respect to the United States, uh, we know that there is an even larger universe of, of university destinations in the United States. And so, um, you know, we know that students will still actively be considering the United States uh, for their programs. So um, we're happy to be in the position that we're in, but we, we don't we don't take it lightly. And uh, that's my dog chiming in. Sorry. Great. No, it's fine. It's always good to know where the, the barking or the uh, the email alerts are coming from. We, we normally get a few through the hour. It's absolutely fine. Um, to that point about the the students who are now back on campus, perhaps returning students or perhaps for the first time, um, are there are there new opportunities to keep engaging with them through digital platforms in order to? gather greater amounts of feedback about the on-campus experience? I mean, is this something that you are looking into or that you're, you, you see the potential in if you, if you haven't done so already? I'll just start by saying that there's in, been increased communication with students to get their feedback through student surveys, um, the, camp, the uh, campus of the culture from the student perspective, and also similar uh, webinars with peers such as this to learn some of those best practices that we're able to bring back to the campus to introduce change. So certainly we are um, ongoing looking for student feedback, um, particularly right now with all the, the various changes and challenges that students have, we wanna be able to uh, meet the needs um, that they have and, and so that they still have 
a uh, rewarding and rich learning and student experience. And, and how important is uh, peer support as part of that? You know, are, is there an opportunity now, you know, with the ease of use of digital platforms to say to your perhaps more experienced Chinese um, students, okay, well, you know, you, you can either help us with the new arrivals or you can tell us, I don't think you touched on this slightly in your answer, but you can tell us what's the information that you wished you had that you didn't or that you think you were, a, 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 someone who is um, joining for the first time may want. I mean, is there, do you think there's appetite among fellow Chinese students to be part of that process? Um, absolutely. And I'll just share, you know, one of the, the largest thing when, I, when you talk about um, peer groups, and I'm meaning my own colleagues and peers, um, because that's been monumental for me during this process, is learning about what are other campuses doing that works. Um, we're, we're all in this essentially together, although we're at different campuses, it's a, it's a huge effort to um, make students and families feel comfortable during this time. So there's a lot of changes that are ongoing at the campus and changes that will continue. And so having these types of conversations and just even right now, just hearing from my colleagues, learning what you're doing at your campuses helps me be more critical and intentional on our thoughts and ways that we can introduce change. I think it's it, it's it's critical and important to continue this conversation and continue to survey students and find out what's important to them and what their needs are. And, and at, at USF, how is this, or is this changing the shape of the, perhaps the lifelong learning provision that you're offering as an entire institution? Um, and does that serve your, your Chinese students in a slightly different way? And is alumni engagement, do you think that will change over the medium to long term with Chinese students also? Oh, absolutely. Um, and those two, when you look at even grad admissions and you look at alumni engagement and other areas on campus, we're being very creative and strategic in how we utilize all our stakeholders in the recruitment and yield process. And we want to be able to do that. So we are fast forward thinking about it now and put in uh, strategies in place where we can, again, utilize all those stakeholders to help us in those areas. Uh, we do luckily and thankfully have um, colleagues who are alums in China working in, in, in uh, careers which are uh, important to prospective and current students knowing what you know, job placement and career opportunities are like. So working with alumni are really gonna be helpful in that area. Um, but we also want students to know what graduate study opportunities are available to them. So as we embark on this new project with Sonorbus, one of the things that we are doing while we are focused on undergraduate recruitment, we know that grad study is going to be something of an interest to them as well. So we're including landing pages for grad studies and knowing what types of certificate programs and other professional opportunities are for students as they're looking to study in the US, um, particularly at USF. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Sherry. Um, Carolyn, you mentioned earlier the advantages of the, the post-study visa program in Canada and how that helps, um, you know, give you a competitive advantage in what is a very competitive landscape. Do you think um, encouraging graduates to stay in the in the country or even the, the locale for longer can help and increase the lifelong learning provision that you're able to offer or increase the amount of alumni engagement that you have long term? Again, with these, you know, the, now you have um, a more of a blended approach, perhaps all people are just so much more used to using digital apps that have a lot of immediacy to them. Um, I mean, it can. I think it does have the potential for that, but uh, uh, part of uh, the exploration has to be sort of knowing your students' uh, future wants and needs. And as a recruiter, and, and you've, you've enrolled a new class, part of the challenge is, of course, next cycle, you're off recruiting a new class. You can lose touch a little bit with your current students if you're, if, if you're not too careful. Um, and so one of the things my team and I have spent some time doing over the past several months and will continue to do is, is to make sure that we're still very much connected to current students in their upper years so that um, we, can, we can have those follow-on conversations about the work in Canada or graduate studies, what their longer-term goals are. Um, 
a few years ago, we, we opened up co-ops and internships to international student participation in a way that had not been possible previously. So the past several months as, as international interns are coming back from the jobs and the workplaces that they've been in, and of course, for them to come back from their, from their virtual workplace during the pandemic and seeing what they've done, the companies that they're working with has been uh, very, very exciting. So continuing that, that relationship as, as much as feasible or, or possible with upper year students. Um, you know, with respect to a possible sort of longer work study or stay in Canada, knowing your audience, um, I certainly know that some groups around the world are more open to those possibilities and then sharing those possibilities with them. Other, other groups are just more clearly focused on they're here for a very specific degree program for a very set uh, period of time. They want you to partner with them for success in, in achieving that skill or that credential, but then um, they may not necessarily be interested in living and working in Canada after their, after their program is done. So really knowing, um, targeting, marketing those segments as appropriate. Some students will want a continued connection to Canada, uh, others not so much. So it really varies. Okay, thank you. And, and Michael, how is that process of managing, you know, the, the current student cycle and looking ahead to future um, lifelong learning and alumni engagement? Is that starting to coalesce into a single student journey at Notre Dame when you consider Chinese students? Definitely, and I, I appreciate hearing what um, our colleagues are doing in this space. I agree that we're all working to try and knit together that experience so that it's one whole journey for the student. So um, to Carolyn's point about um, losing touch once the recruited student has arrived, we've been working uh, assiduously with our current students, our current Chinese students, to make sure that they're in close contact with those um, students who are joining the community before they join, but then again, once they arrive. They're, uh, the students who elect to come to Notre Dame have perhaps now, because of the strategies that we're employing, met those uh, current students and have a vision that their life can be like that. I can succeed and flourish in this environment in a place I didn't know was possible, right? And oh, if I'm a Chinese student, I can go and I can have that uh, internship experience in a third country or virtually, and that too is something I wanna pursue. You add the current student into that, plus alumni who have graduated to talk about their journey in the three to five years after they graduate, and then you're bringing in the fact that, oh, I went back to graduate school and I got that second degree at Notre Dame. Again, people hear that and that lands. And so we're really trying to think about all of the engagements that we have as a way to make the student we're recruiting see a long-term future as a member of the Notre Dame family but we're also doing that because we wanna make, in this case, the Chinese student population on campus feel stronger as a community. The more they're interconnected, that makes our campus more international, it makes us more diverse, and it allows us to continue to adapt and grow into the global university we're always in the process of becoming. Okay, great, thank you, Michael. Um, Nicholas, I wanted to ask um, how this changes the landscape of leveraging digital marketing to recruit students, because you're, you know, you have tools that are in place and conversations that are ongoing, yet you now presumably can use these tools to talk to students about all the different things that, that our panelists have touched on today. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's even more important that, you know, when you consider that it takes up to two years to choose, uh, to choose a, a foreign university uh, for, for Chinese students, and, uh, and usually it requires around seven to eight different touch points uh while you know a western student would be more around four to five touch points uh then it's pretty it's pretty clear that you need to be visible across all those various touch points whatever those are digital uh whatever we talk about alumni i think it's extremely important to uh, to engage your alumni community via uh, digital channels because obviously they would be one of those uh, eight different touch points so so usually what what we um what we recommend is really to uh, map the whole customer journey uh that starts usually two years uh, before uh before you know 
uh, going to the to the actual institutions, but also, as Michael said, once you are once they are on the ground, to continue the the engagement because you know you you then loop them back to uh, to the prospective students. And once you have mapped this whole journey, you realize that usually it's not like a straight line. There's a lot of back and forth. Agents play a, a very important role in China. Uh, to to uh, to especially on all the admin and and uh, visa side, uh, so that will be another touch point as well. Uh, but you know they will usually hear about your institution either through an alumni or because they know someone or because of the name of uh, of the institution or simply because they attended you know a fair in China. And then what they would be doing is obviously be looking for the official uh, the official voice, which is the website, because we we. Which is extremely important, but we always forget that actually you still need to have a website in China. And it sounds obvious because you know your website that you have in the US would work everywhere else in the world, but actually not in China. Uh, many because of the regulation and the Great Firewall. So this means that if you want to have your official voice in China, you actually need to recreate a website specifically for this audience. Doesn't have to be your full website. It can be a microsite dedicated to a Chinese audience, but you need to have a presence that will load fast in China. For anyone who went to mainland China. China, you know, obviously not over the last two years, but but before, you know, one would have noticed that it's extremely difficult to have access to a Western website. Actually, we, we did some research and 85% of Western institutions' websites doesn't load well in China. So you need to have your officer voice, obviously, for them to be to be able to, to have access to information. You need to have a WeChat official account, as I, as I said, because that would be an amazing way to engage with your, with your audience, but also because they will be asking questions in their inner circle about your institutions. And then obviously you will need to be on some portals that list different courses. So you need to really map all the different channels, all the different touch points and making sure that your institution is you know, represented throughout those channels to be able to answer any questions if needed uh, or to be able to, uh, to engage with alumni uh, as well. Thank you. So these additional touch points that you mentioned that might be potential blind spots for Western universities when they're when they're anticipating the Chinese student journey. I mean, is this the you know the Chinese microsite that, as you say, doesn't always necessarily work for Western institutions? Um, the presence of agents there and the roles that they play and how universities work with them locally. Um, are there any other key areas that you see missed a lot of the time by Western universities when they're when they're trying to anticipate what Chinese students want? Yes, I think I think we we um, more and more we see institutions who have a good understanding that China is different, and because it's different, you have to have you know a different website, you have to have uh, WeChat because obviously Facebook doesn't work, uh, Twitter doesn't work, and, and, and so forth. Uh, but what we, what we notice is that um, um, it's it's very rare that institutions understand that it's an it's a continuous investment and engagement, and it makes sense. You know, if you have a website that works in China, unless you do anything something to drive demand and traffic to this website, it's as if you had a billboard in the middle of nowhere. If you publish amazing content on WeChat, but you don't do anything to acquire your audience because it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, it's not like you know Weibo or or, or, or this type of uh, channel. Uh, then obviously you will have only three or, or five followers. Uh, so it's again as if you had a billboard in the, in the middle of nowhere. So, so we also encourage institutions to make sure that they are there for the long term and they keep engaging and investing in those channels because obviously, obviously otherwise you can have amazing content, but no one will uh, will see them. And it's interesting because I we realize that a lot of institutions don't 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 make this mistake usually with other countries, but with China, uh, you know, because they invested already in the website and the WeChat, they actually don't think of you know the demand acquisition side of things, which by the way doesn't have to be to be uh, very onerous. You can you can leverage your base, you can leverage your your current students, you can leverage your alumni. I always say the alumni is your best influencers, and you don't have to actually buy a lot of media and spend a lot of money uh, to start engaging, but you do need to have activities that are there just to drive demand and traffic to grow your base in China. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Um, we're into the final 10 minutes or so. We've had we've had a few questions, um, actually, predictably about WeChat and people wanting to know more. Um, one of them was to, um, was to ask the panelists, uh, when they are communicating via WeChat, what is their preferred mode? So is this in English? Is it in Chinese? Do they vary the language depending on whether it's a student audience or a parent parental audience? And, and do they have a specialist on staff who is using WeChat to communicate? Um, I'll go first and say that depending on who the audience is, will detect um, what language the the message is in. Generally, um, 
we'll send the English version. And if we, if our audience are for parents, then we will have it translated to Chinese to meet those needs. Um, and even I'll say when we send out certain email communications, we'll have a Chinese version just in case it's being passed on to parents and some counselors who may not be proficient in English. We do have a student international ambassador on our team that will help with translations um, and making sure we can effectively communicate with that audience. Okay, thank you. And Carolyn, how does the process look at Western? Um, we're fortunate to have several Mandarin speakers who are on full-time staff. We do supplement those with international student ambassadors uh, as well. And so um, there, there is a process for uh, translating and, and you know, having a, a Chinese version as close to real time as when we've created something in, in English. Um, one of the things I would note uh, on the basis of what Shari just shared is I certainly think my university could do more in terms of, of reaching out to additional audiences. I, I think we have not fully taken advantage of, of what we could do if we had a more intentional focus with respect to, to parent groups. So there's, um, even, even when you uh, have um, that, that sort of advantage or that skill set in house with respect to Chinese language and culture, there's, there's always more things that you could be doing um, that you probably haven't thought of yet or just haven't gotten around to. In our case, we just recently implemented CRM. And, and so at adding additional constituencies, such as more of a focus on parents, um, will be, I think, a stretch goal for us in the future. Okay. Yeah, and, and that, that's a big plus, just to, to add on, on this, uh, for, from what Caroline said, that the, the WeChat allows you, unlike Facebook, to segment your audience in terms of content. So you can actually post, you know, and create specific content for alumni, for prospective students, for current students, for parents as well. And so it's very easy to, to regroup that. So through, through, through a platform such as Sinovis, for instance, you can create your different groups, uh, create your different content and then link this back based uh, integrated with your CRM. So, so this is this is a unique way how you can leverage WeChat to communicate to your audience. So you can do it in Chinese, you can do it in English. Um, as Shari said it, it, as well, it, usually with parents, you have to do it in Chinese and it's always better to communicate to communicate in Chinese with this audience anyway. Okay, thank you. And, and Michael, do you have uh, do you use bilingual communications when you're speaking to that market? We do use bilingual. I would say the vast majority of our WeChat communications are in Mandarin. Um, that said, when we have started to branch out and have campus constituents who uh, either have not been to China or don't speak Mandarin, of course, we're doing that in English. Um, I will say that we do try to do things bilingually if it's a formal announcement of the university that comes out first in English. We want to get that translated as quickly as possible. Um, as Sharon and Carolyn mentioned. And are these um, uh, specialist members of staff that you've hired as you've increased your provision? Sorry, I, I appreciate that. Um, and the answer is yes. While we have everyone on our team in Beijing um, able to uh, maneuver their way through the WeChat platforms that we have, um, we also have a team member here who can do the same. So we're we're trying to work it in both time zones in real time. And sometimes we do use WeChat here on campus and speak to our Chinese students in Mandarin as well. I think that's important, again, to create that fabric of community we were talking about earlier. OK, thank you very much. Um, Nico, we've had one, one other question, which is just regarding perhaps safety concerns around using WeChat for US colleges. I mean, I perhaps pick you as a neutral party on our panel. Um, you know, is this something that you hear from the universities that you work with? Do they have safety concerns about these platforms? Yes, yes, obviously, uh, uh, yes, everywhere <laughs> in the US, obviously in Australia. Uh, usually, answer, which I don't know if it's a good answer or not, but we, we usually said that is as safe as Facebook. So, <laughs> uh, which I don't know if it's a, it's a good thing or not, but but it is it is very similar. So, for privacy concerns, that would be very similar to any other social media. So we don't see that it's it's worse because it's in China. It's just social media in general, and the fact that obviously social social networks leverage data for a living. Uh, uh, now, having said that, uh, you, you might be aware that China just went through the, the, the new China security law, which is following really uh, closely the GDPR. So it's actually uh, uh, personal information is extremely sensitive in China um, and very secure. So, so 
So this has improved a lot um, uh, recently, uh, and all data processes and service providers have to be compliant with the China security law. So, so I think this is this is helping. Uh, the other the other recommendation that we we usually make is that if you have a doubt, um, you can you can do it in a way where no sensitive information stays on WeChat and goes straight to your to your to your systems. So, so for instance, we have institutions that are leveraging a platform that uh, communicate via WeChat and the information doesn't stay on WeChat. It doesn't stay on our platform. It goes straight to the CI. Uh, so this this is another way how you can you can also try to increase uh, to to increase the safety. Okay. And when you're managing data sets in general, is this something that is um, do you find there are in, an increasing number of queries now? I mean, I'm just conscious of that. I mean, it's not relevant to today's discussion, perhaps, but um, being in London and just the way that the data laws are changing in the UK, it's something that is quite a big sizable shift when it does happen. So um, when there is a change in the law, is it a case of being able to work with universities clearly and effectively so that you can, again, answer any questions that university partners have, but also help them prepare for communications with um, any students who have concerns about data and privacy? Absolutely, absolutely. And as we work with hundreds of institutions from all around the world, state universities, and national universities, uh, you can imagine that this is this is paramount uh, 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 for, for, for all of them. Uh, so we we uh, we um, from a Synovus perspective, we obviously made sure that we are compliant with all the different regulations from all around the world, whatever it is, the Canadian privacy law, whatever it is, GDPR, the San Francisco, the, the Californian one. Uh, the Australian one and so forth. So, so this is this is extremely important. But what what we re, what we usually um, uh, uh, share with our with our, with our institutions is that this is a shared responsibility. It's a you know uh, obviously you need to make sure that you leverage a tool such as Synovus or another one that will be hundred percent compliant with those uh, those rules and regulations. But you need as well to be compliant, and and this is extremely important because not everything is done by the tool. So we we usually always. You know, spend a little bit of time to go through the the whole process with our institution partners to 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 explain that actually responsibility is shared because you are the owner of the content and you are producing it. You obviously need also to be compliant with this regulation. It's, uh, with the China security security law, it's it's a little bit of a, a gray area in the sense where usually you need to be compliant with the CSL only when you are hosted in mainland China. Uh, but obviously, because you are targeting a Chinese audience, it's better to be compliant, even, even if you're not hosted in mainland China, which is the case of 98% of our clients. So that's why we usually recommend to be compliant with this regulation, which, by the way, as I said, is very, very close to the GDPR now. So it's, it, you know, when most institutions are compliant with GDPR, so, so that shouldn't be an issue to be compliant with the CSL. But it's a very, very important topic indeed. Okay, great. Thank you, Nico. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to um, extend a question to Sherry and Michael that, that Carolyn answered previously when she talks about the um, what remaining strategic challenges there were and what she would like to see her, her institution do more of. I was wondering if, um, Sherry, Michael, not to put you on the spot, but do you think there's a particular area where you would like to expand or improve or a challenge that you would like to address that you think you maybe is a work in progress at your institution? Yeah, well, I'll say first that um, there are two projects that we are currently working on. So this is what we are going to be focused on, which will also be part of the challenge of really how to navigate the world of the digital marketing within China with respect to WeChat and the Chinese website that we are creating because we didn't have enough, our own um, site that we own in terms of the domain. So we're working with Sonorvis now on that. So all of that is in a development stage. So as we move forward over the next couple of months, I believe we're going to be challenged to just making sure that we are doing this in the most strategic and effective way. And, you know, Nicholas talked about all the, the various touch points and touch points that campuses miss. We, we want to hopefully not miss any. So we want to figure out what those touch points, all of those touch points are in additional ways that we could um, put on our site to um, connect more with students over the that lifelong educational journey because there's many ways outside of just undergraduate admissions that we're going to be sharing with them and we want to just be able to be strategic with you know search engine optimization making sure they can find us in many different ways um, in the digital space in, in china so that's going to be a challenge over the next few months for, for, for us um, so i'm just looking forward to to learning more working more with nicholas and and continuing le learning from my peers um, at the uh, other campuses across the US. 
Thank you very much, Shari. Um, Michael, we're very tight for time, I'm afraid, but if there's something you'd like to add? I would just say um, the area that I would like to see us move into that we haven't yet, but but the work we've been talking about today could help us do that, would be we're used to working in a pretty narrow register within China. Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, when in fact, uh, Shenzhen, but in fact, uh, we have great aspirations to be more present in places like Xi'an or Chengdu or Guangzhou, but um, we as a university have not made that next step in investment, either in the technology or the tools that we've talked about today or the resources, but it's something I could see us growing into um, in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Well, that really does take us up to time, I'm afraid. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I think we had about 100 people in the audience, which is fantastic to see such a strong turnout. Um, an on-demand version of this recording will be made available on the THE website, along with a summary article that contains its key takeaways for any of you who would like to revisit this content or perhaps share it with your colleagues or peers. Um, I'd like to thank our panel for joining us. So Nicholas, Michael, Shari and Carolyn, it's been really great to hear from you all and hear so many different perspectives about how you're all taking on the challenge of this of, uh, of recruiting Chinese students and yes we hope to see you all at future THE events so thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.